Okay, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for attending our workshop today as a part of the 29th annual MLK uh, Community Celebration. My name is Paula Groves Price and I am the Associate Dean for Diversity and International Programs in the College of Education. Uh, we are honored today to have Jasiri X uh, with us to engage in an inspiring workshop and dialogue on some of our most pressing issues facing our communities. This workshop entitled How to Succeed in Hip Hop Without Selling Your Soul will provide us the opportunity to hear Jasiri X's inspiring personal journey with hip hop and social activism. And like his music, I am certain that he will also push us to think critically about our own efforts to dismantle systems of white supremacy, power and privilege, um, as well as how we can all work to change many of the negative perceptions that are out there about people of color and hip hop. As a member of the MLK committee, uh, we hope that each of you leave today's workshop inspired to take the messages back to your networks and that you use your own power uh, and influence for greater social justice. So let's give a warm cougar welcome to Jasiri X. So what's the state of the black world when the hood raised black boys and black girls? Before you pass judgment on us, to Siri X gonna give you something to discuss. See, these streets will talk to you if you understand the language. Corners become famous. The more blood they stain with, the more murals painted when shells hit the pavement. We need three Jesuses to come and save this. We need Moses, Abraham, and David, all 12 disciples, to wash away the blood on that hand and held the rifle. Because life's so hard, he like whoever show they face tonight is getting robbed when your home is a grave. The streets is amazing, so many cats blaze, it's hard to see through the haze. And crime pays way more than minimum wage, and plus the lead from the gauge will take a swim in your ways, loosen your braids, leave ball spots to your fade, like you got your hair cut with some raggedy blaze. The truth is, we know better out than women with slaves. Malcolm X and Dr. King probably spinning their graves. It's got to be the last days I can't take no more. And these kids, they don't haul them shake no more. They in the kitchen, cooking up cakes galore, kicking down doors like everybody faced the floor. And they got guns that will make you shake and contort. And they don't shoot ball, they shoot 38 for sport. Getting tried as adults when they can't sit to court. Getting sent to state prison, getting raped, oh Lord. What did we do to deserve this condition where we can't even function with our herb in our system? And every hit we take from a split blurs our vision and the next day just means another murder victim in the summer. Just means we gonna get dumber, coroners putting bodies under covers. And in between sheets like the Ozzy brothers, he told his mother that he loved the hood, but the hood will never love you. See, what's the state of the black world when the hood raised black boys and black girls? Before you pass judgment on us, to Siri X gonna give you something to discuss. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? Yeah. Peace. Uh, so that was a piece that I wrote. I actually went to a conference called The State of the Black World, and there was a lot of, like, you know, elders there and a lot of, you know, uh, you know what you would call black leaders there. And I felt like um, as somebody coming from the younger generation that a lot of the conversation towards us was really condescending. And it was kind of like, a, what's wrong with your generation? How come you all haven't, you know, um, followed through on these great gains that we made, um, you know, and, and, and followed up with them? Why don't you just pull your pants up? And um, so I always say, like, wow, well, if young people don't know, whose responsibility is it? Is it those young people's responsibility for not knowing? Or is it the responsibility of those that have the knowledge to come and teach the young people who don't know what they know. And if there's nobody in our communities to teach us, and we really kind of almost in a sense become that, I don't necessarily want to say in a forgotten generation, but a generation that was kind of like left to our own devices in a sense. And so now we're rising up and do all these different things. And sometimes elders want to come out of the woodwork and criticize us like, but where were you for the past 20 years? You know, when we were dealing with the, uh, the ramifications of you know, a wave of crack cocaine hitting our communities and what happened then. When all the jobs moved out of our communities and overseas, like where, were, where have you been, you know, when our only options were, you know, hitting the block and, and, or maybe if you was a good athlete or the army. And, and that's all we kind of had to look towards. And so if, you know, social media or television or radio or young people our own age are raising us, then this is what you're gonna get. 
you know. So I would always put it upon, particularly, you know, sometimes when you come to college, you might, you know, maybe some people are from Pullman, but sometimes you're coming from a community much different than the community you're coming into. And it's like, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing, you know, I, and I know it's difficult, particularly as a person of color, but at the same time, I feel like we have a responsibility to then take the knowledge and information that we learn back to the communities that we come from, particularly if they're depressed communities, the economic depressed communities, we have that added responsibility. Some might not agree. I feel the same way as a hip hop artist. I feel like it's not enough for you know me to just be a conscious rapper. I feel like the stakes are too high and the situation is too dire for me just to rap and give you some good words that might make you feel good and make you think. I feel like I have a greater responsibility. And I feel like as an artist of color that I don't have the luxury to just make art for art's sake because I'm in a white supremacist system, you know what I'm saying? Like, like we're dying, we're being killed, you know, we're suffering. Poverty, you know, in, in Flint, Michigan, they can't even turn the water faucet on, primarily because it's a poor and black city. Um, and so I can't just say, hey, I'm a, you know, we gonna hit the club and da da da. That's how I feel, you know what I'm saying? You know, so yeah, how you doing? My name is Jusiri X. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna thank uh, Washington State University for having me. And um, I really want this to be a dialogue. Um, this conversation, you know, later on, um, you know, it's funny, these are my, my two favorite topics, which is like hip hop and race. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of later on will be more of the talk. I would like this to be more of a conversation um, around hip hop. So if you have any questions or any comments, don't feel like you have to wait to an end in the question and answer process. I don't know if there's a microphone. I know it's being last year. I don't know if there's a microphone that we can bring into the crowd, you know what I'm saying? But um, Oftentimes, what I create and the type of music that I do is to create dialogue. Uh, and so this is all my social media. So when I leave, you can still have a piece of Jasiri X. Like, there he is, right there. Um, so I would encourage y'all to do so. I do, I, I, I have a Snapchat. I haven't got into Snapchat yet. I know, like, I almost have to, you know. I, I speak at high schools. They like, yo, if you ain't on Snapchat, we not even looking at you, you know. We not, but it's, it's a commitment. It's like, to to learn and like develop another, it's work, like doing social media is work, you know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to, in my mind, decide whether or not, so I don't know if you pro or maybe against Snapchat, maybe we can have a conversation later and you can convince me. Uh, so this is kind of where to get me right now in Bandcamp, for those that's unfamiliar with Bandcamp, it's a music site. Uh, some people use SoundCloud, I have SoundCloud too. I personally like Bandcamp better because you can monetize it uh, my new uh, album is on Bandcamp right now. It's called Black Liberation Theology. Um, Bandcamp allowed me to put a pay what you want option. So you can put zero and you can download the album if you, you know, financially you might not be able to come up with it, but you might want to hear it or you can donate whatever you want. So I've had people go from zero to $50 to support the album. And then even if you put zero, you still have to put your email address in and that's something that then I can take and then you're gonna get my newsletter until maybe you, you know, you could unsubscribe, I guess, if you wanted to. <laughs> but if you don't, you're gonna get my newsletter once a month and that kind of allows you to kind of build uh, this fan base outside of the current structure. And I also like to start with this because, you know, I'm an artist that came out of social media. Um, very non-traditionally, kind of how I came to find myself in Pullman. Never would have thought, you know what I'm saying, a few years ago that I would be here uh, so I took a very non-traditional route that I want to talk about, but I kind of came, I don't know, do y'all remember MySpace? Y'all yeah. have, have MySpace pages? You remember like, remember like, this is how I learned a little bit of HTML, like, because I wanted my MySpace page to be cool and you had to go in and make your page pop. So I came, I came off of MySpace and I came off of a, you know, I had a MySpace music page. And um, basically I heard about a situation that happened um, in, in Gina, Louisiana called the Gina Six. I don't know, do y'all remember the Gina Six? Uh, for those that don't know, you know, just a quick summary, uh, y'all heard of the term the wrong side of the tracks? So in, in, in this community in Gina, Louisiana, and I think at that time it was 2005, 2006, you know, it was a segregated community. And they, they segregated communities in the South oftentimes with the train track. 
And so on one side of the train track in Gina was poor black people, and the other side was more affluent or white people. And at the high school in Gina, there was a tree that the unwritten rule was only white students were allowed to sit under the tree. Remind you, this is in 1965, this is 2005. And so a black student sat under the tree and some white students hung nooses from the tree. Basically to say, no, nah, this is our tree. So it caused a lot of racial tension in the school. And so the, the prosecutor of that county comes to the school, but he only comes to talk to the black students. And basically like threatens the black students, like you all need to stop, I could end your life with a stroke of a pen. And so unfortunately the racial tension didn't stop. Um, it was a party off campus that some white students had. A black student went and got jumped. Next day in school, some of the black students seen one of the guys that jumped them. They jumped him. And instead of getting suspended like the people on the nooses did, they were charged with attempted murder. Um, even though that student that they beat up didn't even spend one night in, in, in the hospital, they were charged with attempted murder. And one young man was given 10 years in prison. His name was Michael Bell. He had a college scholarship to go to LSU to play football. Career over, you're in prison. So this was the first time that I saw people begin to use social media to kind of spread the story. And people were using MySpace and changing their profile picture uh, to information about the Gina 6. Some guy uh, made like a video just breaking the whole story down. And that kind of went viral on YouTube. And so I'm in Pittsburgh. I hear about it. And you know, at that time, I quit rapping. Uh, because I was told over and over again, like, nobody wants to hear music with a message. Nobody wants to hear music with a message. You, when you hear that over and over again, and that was what I was interested in doing. You know, I was interested in making music with a message, so I basically said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to just, you know, we were active in the community. We started an organization called One Hood. I'll get into that a little bit later. And so I was just being an activist. I heard about the Gina 6, and I said, you know, I'm going to write a song about this. And I wrote it, and I put it on my MySpace page, and I sent it to, at that time, the website that I used was called allhiphop.com. You know what I'm saying? And this was pre-Worldstar, I believe. I don't know, Worldstar might have just began to emerge, and I have you know, mixed feelings about Worldstar, if you want to talk about that. Uh, later on, we can. So um, somebody called me. I'm at my job. I was working for Pittsburgh Public Schools, and they called me, and they said, hey, man, your, your song's on the front page of All Hip Hop. And I thought I made it. I was like, what? And so like, I left my job in the middle of the day because the school blocked those type of websites, you know what I'm saying? So I left. I like, went home and was like, oh, I'm on the front page of All Hip Hop. And then uh, I got a call from a radio show called The Michael Bazin Show, and they said, we want to interview you. Now, I didn't know at the time that Michael Bazin had the largest syndicated radio show in the country when it came to black audiences, that he was in every major black city in the country. And so he said my name, Jasiri X. I'm getting calls from people all over the country man, this is a big opportunity. So Michael Bazin played the song. He said it got such a response, he played it two times in a row. And it was like, now I'm off. Now I'm in Gina. And I kind of became, you know, uh, uh, almost, it became the anthem for this movement. And I appreciate Michael Bazin for playing it, even though I was, at that time, I guess you would say I was a nobody. I was, I was, an, I was not a named rapper. Um, and so, that kind of launched me, but what really changed my mind was all the messages I got from people on MySpace, particularly people from my generation thanking me for making a song, telling me how much the song affected them, what it meant to them, how it inspired them. And I really was like, I was lied to. Like they kept telling me that, that my generation didn't want to hear this type of music, but here's all these messages I'm getting from people all over the country thanking me for creating a song like that. When I, end up, when I got to Gina, it was 60,000 people in Gina, Louisiana. Uh, that showed up for this massive protest, primarily people college age or younger that were there. And so I was like, wow, you know, this is, so I began to work on an album I made. I created an album called um, I Got That X. Uh, it's on my band camp if you want to check it out. Um, and uh, I was off, you know, and I was kind of deciding like as an artist what I wanted to do. And then another situation happened with a, a young man in New York City named Sean Bell. Did anybody remember the Sean Bell? case where Sean Bell was a young man who, um, he was getting married. So, you know, before you get married, him and the fellas go out, they have like a little bachelor party. He's leaving the party or the club. He gets in his car, he goes to pull off, and he doesn't notice an undercover police officer was there. Those undercover officers shoot up 51 shots into Sean Bell's car, killing Sean Bell. He is unarmed. He didn't 
break any laws. He didn't have any drugs on him, anything like that. And so um, not that if he did, that would justify his murder. Uh, but so the, the case went to court. Cops were found what? Not guilty. And so when, it, when they were found not guilty, all of a sudden, I started getting all these messages on MySpace. And people were saying, you should write a song about this. You should, because I was the guy that did the Gina Six song. And initially, my, my thinking was, I was reluctant because I didn't want to be like the, you know, tragedy rapper. Like, I come out when something bad happens to the community. Uh, but what caused me to want to write the song was that um, I didn't see any other mainstream rappers really addressing these type of topics. So when I did the Gina Six song, the hook was, so I said, uh, uh, call Wheezy, call Baby, call BG, call Juvenile, Manny Fresh, call Master P. So the Slim with a roll, but he in the ground. Somebody call Young Turkey about to get out. Call Romeo, he balling on a scholarship. Don't be silenced by record label politics. And, I, and people thought it was a diss, like, oh, you were dissing Wheezy and Wayne and Master P. And I was like, nah, I, I was saying, call them. You know what I'm saying? I was encouraging them because I felt like these young men who were in the Gina Six, these were the men that made you hot. These were the young brothers that supported you before you were platinum. These are the people that, like, are you. So I felt like it was 60,000 people in Gina. It maybe if Wheezy was there and Baby was there, Master P was there, it might have been a million people. We might have been able to free that brother that day, even though, thankfully, Michael Bell got out. Um, he actually, uh, I think, just graduated uh, college, is in law school, so that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that brother and that he, that he was able to do that. But So I was calling on these artists, and so when I didn't see artists doing this type of thing, um, I made a song called Enough's Enough, and it was the first video I had on World Star. Shout out to World Star uh, for that. And... Um, and it ended up leading to me doing a segment on BET's Rap City. Um, and so I'm seeing, like, here I am um, really speaking to these real issues that I wanted to speak about as an artist. And I'm also kind of, like, getting my name out there to the point where I'm doing, like, I'm becoming known. You know, I'm buzzing. And it was kind of like, wow, you know, um, this is interesting. So I, I, I feel like I was kind of recruited in a sense to be somebody that began to deal with these different topics um, that happened. Now, I'm from Pittsburgh. Well, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm from the south side of Chicago. Any Chicago folks in the house? No? Anybody been in Chicago? No, I'm just <laughs> So um, just to give you a little bit of background um, as to also why I tend to discuss the topics that I talk about. Um, so I'm originally from the south side of Chicago. Um, my given name is Jaceria Rondé. My mother raised me socially conscious, but I'm in a, I'm in a basically 100% black environment. I went to a Catholic school in Chicago, but outside of the fathers and nuns, all the students were black. And uh, we ended up moving to a neighborhood in Chicago called Roseland. Um, people in Chicago sometimes refer to it as the Wild Hundreds. And, um, you know, I began to explore the life or, or, or that was outside of my door. And, um, you know, my history was, you know, that, um, you know, Chicago is very much gang affiliated. I'm talking about going all the way back to Al Capone's. It's just a gang city. And so uh, my mother saw me beginning to get into things that she didn't want. Specifically me, I have an older sister, but it was specifically the things that she saw me getting into. And so she moved us from the south side of Chicago to a suburb of Pittsburgh called Monroeville, Pennsylvania. So I went from a 100% black environment to a 95% white environment. And dealing, and like having racism like hit you directly in the face. Just like, you know what I'm saying? I remember the first time we went to the Monroeville Mall, a drunk white person called us niggas. And I'm like, yo, <laughs> like, where am I, you know? I remember the first day of school, they were like, what's the biggest difference? I was like, all oh, you white people, that's the biggest difference. Um, and so it was a difficult transition. And you know, I, I, after I realized like you can't fight everybody, you know, I began to, those you know, lessons that my mother taught, taught me about Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, I began to like, oh, this is what she meant. And so we started a black club in our school called the Our Cultures Club. We got our school to teach black history and it showed me like, 
this is kind of how we can kind of combat um, these different things. And so that's kind of how, and part of the reason why also I talk about uh, the subject that I want to talk about, but being, did anybody know, what do y'all know about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, if I may ask you? Any Pittsburgh people here? No. Uh, oh, 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 Steelers, Steelers. Steeler, you're a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. Okay, so you felt our pain when uh, they lost to Denver. Um, besides Pittsburgh, besides the Steelers, what else do y'all know about Pittsburgh? Anybody? Yes. Steel Town, it was. It is no longer a Steel Town now. It's much, much different. Yes. True. Yes. Yes. Billy Eckstein. Um, yes. You can. And, Pits and also Pittsburgh, when it came to the history of jazz, it was this place because it was in between like New York and um, like Cleveland. It was like you would come, the, the, the people would come through Pittsburgh on their way to kind of like the rest of the Midwest. You know what I'm saying? So Miles Davis used to live there at one time. So there's a, definitely an extensive history of jazz. Uh, in relation to the city of Pittsburgh, uh, George Benson, um, of course. Anybody else? Really? Okay, yeah. The poster child for Harwood. Okay, I'll take that. Um, yes, Heinz. Yes, yes. Any rappers from Pittsburgh that you all know? You said somebody? Wiz, right? Wiz Khalifa. So that's that's pretty much. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, usually like when I ask people that question, it's the Steelers and Wiz, that's it. You know what I'm saying? That's pretty much people's understanding of Pittsburgh. Did you all know that Pittsburgh was called America's most livable city? So interestingly enough, Forbes Magazine uh, came in and said, Pittsburgh was America's most livable city. The same year that they, Forbes Magazine called Pittsburgh's America's most livable city, the United States Census came up with a report that said Pittsburgh has the poorest working class black community in the country. So we're like, if it's the most livable city, <laughs> who are you saying it's most livable for? So this is kind of, you know, the response. So this is my, I guess, repping Pittsburgh song that I want to play for you. It's called America's Most Livable City. Welcome to America's most livable city. Please ignore the invisibles with me. See Pittsburgh, we built this economy, but we still lead the nation in black poverty. Welcome to America's most livable city. Just ignore the invisibles with me. State your business, cause here, the place you live in depends on your race and privilege. They call it Clipsburg, Pennsylvania, but block dictators will launch missiles to bang ya. While hot metal come whistling out the chamber to maim ya, twisting ya like WrestleMania. And what's crazier, the bishop won't pray for ya. Your family's so poor they can't even afford a crate for ya. And then them skyscrapers, bro, they can't wait for us to move out the hood so they can take it and lace it up. Transit cuts, a brother can't even take the bus. This is the ugly truth. No need to make it up. Then some magazine comes along and places us as most livable in the USA. What? Say what? Guess they didn't survey us. Cause life is cut shorter than razors where they raise us. Judges erase us and quick to hang us. And police tase us until we never wake up. Welcome to America's most livable city. Please ignore the invisibles with me. See Pittsburgh, we built this economy. But we still lead the nation in black poverty. Welcome to America's most livable city. City. Just ignore the invisibles with me and state your business. Cause here, the place you live in depends on your race and privilege. And downtown, there's a bunch of new buildings, glass and steel cathedrals that cost a few million. They make billions to treat the dude's illness with medicine and pharmaceuticals. So who's dealing? But the schools are failing. Screw children. Just make sure the office has a see through ceiling. Pitt University and CMU killing. Classes cost thousands. I don't see you fill them. How we gonna get a job? in biotechnology if all we ever learn is survival psychology and why we so poor if y'all revive the economy but we ain't get nothing besides an apology tear down the projects and put up a target to build new homes so they can stimulate the market but move us out the neighborhood so we can never harvest the only thing we guarantee in pittsburgh
Pittsburgh's charges. Welcome to America's most livable city. Please ignore the invisibles with me. See Pittsburgh, we built its economy, but we still lead the nation in black poverty. Welcome to America's most livable city. Just ignore the invisibles with me and state your business. Cause here, the place you live in depends on your race and privilege. privilege. All right, so that's uh, America's most livable city. Um, so when I say uh, tear down the projects and put up a target, that actually happened in the neighborhood that I live in. I live in a neighborhood um, in Pittsburgh called East Liberty. And it was a neighborhood that it had like a lot of housing projects and they tore the projects down and they moved people out and they put up a target, put up a Whole Foods, put up a Trader Joe's. And it's like, man, why do these good things can only happen to a community after you move us out of the community. You know, like, why does that have to be the case? Um, there's also a scene in there where you see a young man who has a neck brace on. Um, that was a young man named Jordan Miles um, in Pittsburgh. And Jordan Miles um, was an honor student at the Performing Arts uh, School in Pittsburgh. He played the viola. But he lived in a neighborhood called Homewood. If you saw that thing that said, God, God um, lives in Homewood. Um, and Homewood is a, is a violent neighborhood. And um, he was walking to his grandmother's house every night. He would uh, go to his grandmother's house because his grandmother didn't like to be in the house alone. And three other cover police officers approached Jordan Miles and say, you know, where's the guns, where's the money, where the drugs? And Jordan, being, not being a street kid, thought he was being robbed. And so he tried to run. And of course, the unwritten rule is don't run from the police. And uh, when he slipped on the ice, uh, police proceeded to beat him so badly that his mother didn't recognize him uh, when she went to pick him up. They also, you saw like part of his hair, they actually ripped the locks out of his hair. So if you can just imagine somebody with locks and the force it would take to rip locks. Mind you, Jordan, 5'6", at the time, 130, 40 pounds. Um, and these three officers are pretty big. One of the officers actually trained other officers in martial arts. Um, and so that was a case where, you know, the federal government and the city of Pittsburgh decided not to prosecute those officers, uh, put them right back into a uh, population of officers. And um, our police chief at the time, who was black, basically said that it was a teachable moment to teach young black people not to run from the police. And so that's kind of the environment, you know, oftentimes we're dealing with and why, you know, I feel like it's important to not only speak uh, to those different things, but also organize around them. And so, you know, our response, uh, one of our response, but that's also the cool thing about social media is that it, like, you have a microphone with social media. Now, how you choose to use it, <laughs> and, you know, you can be positive and, you know, you can just troll people all day long if that's what you want to do. You can pick the celebrity that you hate and just bombard them with negativity, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't advise, to me that's a waste of time, that's not productive, you know? Or you could actually begin to respond to different things whether you like them or not. So we didn't just call a press conference to say, how can Pittsburgh be America's most livable city if the black people are the poorest in the community? But we did this video and when we premiered the video, we actually had a forum um, in our community around the economic survival of people of color in Pittsburgh. And so you have that ability now to respond. You know, you could at the mayor on Twitter. You could, you know, sometimes you could, I don't know if the president of Washington State University is on Twitter, but sometimes you can at the president um, and begin to talk about it. And sometimes it's as simple as just you taking out your phone and you kicking your rant in there about something you disagree with and don't like, and you could put that on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or whatever, and just that can go viral, you know? So to me, it's giving people a voice in ways, uh, particularly marginalized folks, that, you know, when you look at the state of journalism, you look at the state of who's reporting on television, you don't see us a lot of times, you know what I'm saying? It's giving marginalized people, whether they black, 
brown, indigenous, you know, L LGBT, a voice now to speak about how we feel. And you kind of, you see that now with the whole conversation around the Oscars, which was started uh, by a, a, a young woman that I follow, Reign of April on Twitter, that basically started the hashtag Oscar so white. And this was like two years ago. And then it starts this national conversation when this year there's no people of color nominated to the point where like every major actor now is being asked about the diversity or lack thereof. And this is a person who went on Twitter, created something and began a conversation. And now they're talking about the Academy is gonna be more diverse. This is the power that we have now to me, if you begin to be consistent and utilize it properly, you know what I'm saying? So shout out to Raina April on that. Um, so, but it also too, I feel like it, it, it needs to be like kind of a virtual piece and then also a real life organizing piece, you know? So for us, it's one thing to create videos online that, you know, some may go viral. It's another thing to deal with real life situations that's happening in our community. So we started an organization called One Hood. And the concept and idea was twofold. One, um, when we started One Hood, it was 2005. It was around a time where, you know, even though I find the term black on black crime problematic, uh, you know, people commit crime where they live. You know what I'm saying? So, if you, you know, as, as the percentage of blacks committing crimes against blacks is similar to the to percentage of whites committing crimes with whites, but we don't say white on white crime. You know what I'm saying? But at that point, we led the nation in violence in our own community, Pennsylvania. And per capita, Pittsburgh was just as violent as a city like Philadelphia. Um, and so, and that violence a lot of times is, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street. And we just felt like it's foolish to, all of us are dealing with poverty. All of us are dealing with failing schools, lack of affordable housing, um, uh, violence, police brutality. but. We take our frustration on one another, you know what I'm saying? And so we felt like it would be better for us to come together in unity and begin to deal with the root causes of, our, uh, of what's really happening in our communities. So we started an organization called One Hood, and you know, it was black and gold, you know, of course, if you know Pittsburgh, that's it's black and yellow. Um, yeah, so, um, and the idea was for us to begin to use hip hop as a way to bring these different communities together, you know, like, Regardless of whatever beef everybody may have, everybody got a rapper or everybody got a record label. Everybody was trying to do some type of hip hop. So we began to use hip hop as a way to kind of bring these communities together. Um, well, in 2010, the Heinz Foundation actually did a study about how black men are portrayed in the media in Pittsburgh. What they found was 90% of the time when they show black men in the media of Pittsburgh, what y'all think the subject is? Crime, yes, 90% of the time. If you add sports, it's almost 100% of the time. They said when it came to quality of life stories about black men, it was less than 3%. And so we saw this and at the time, you know, I had started to have success, uh, me and this gentleman right here, this young gentleman with the beard, I don't know if y'all see that young guy with the beard. Um, for those who are fans of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even like to use the term old school hip hop. That's another problematic term. Uh, classic hip hop. Uh, he was in a group called X Clan uh, that came out in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Prior to that, he was an entertainment director at a club called the Latin Quarters uh, in New York that actually gave, you know, he gave a lot of the, uh, you know, rappers like LL Cool J and Karis One and Public Enemy their first show. And so he ended up uh, being in Pittsburgh. And so as this, you know, sage of wisdom, particularly in hip hop history, you know, this is the story of the creation of hip hop. You know, the creation of hip hop happens at a time where it's a lot of gang activity happening in New York City. And it just so happened that one of the leaders of one of the biggest gangs, uh, a guy at that time named Kevin, won an essay writing contest to take a trip to Africa. Comes back from Africa and changes his name to Africa Bambada and changes the name of the black space to the Zulu Nation and begins this process of utilizing his um, organizing skills. I would argue that he could be called the greatest organizer in our generation. Um, but he began to use it to organize safe spaces where instead of fighting, we could 
rap and we could DJ and we could break dance and we could do graffiti. And I feel like, you know, in, in the pantheon of those godfathers of hip hop, in my humble opinion, Africa Bambada stands out because of that and because of the organization that still exists. The, universe, uh, the Universal Zulu Nation still exists all over the world, you know what I'm saying? Um, so definitely shout out to him. Um, and so we basically went to the Heinz Foundation and said, hey, um, you know, we've had success creating the videos. I did a video called What If The Tea Party Was Black um, that went viral, you know, if you wanna look that up uh, and check that out. And so we said, hey, you know, we've been getting millions of views on YouTube. Um, we would like to teach young black men how to analyze media and create media for themselves. And so they gave us an initial funding to do um, our One Hood Media Academy. And so this was kind of, you know, the initial uh, part of it. Um, and then we had this young, can y'all can see that? That's kind of dark, huh? I don't know if we can lighten that up. But there's a young woman throwing up the deuces. I don't know if y'all see her, her name's Patience. I call her our uh, One Hood's Rosa Parks. She like came to One Hood one day and she didn't care that it was all young men. You know, she said, I wanna be a part of One Hood. Um, and you know, what, what were we gonna do, kick you out? We were like, okay, well, so we went to our funders and said, hey, um, can we open up One Hood um, to young women? And now this is what, you know, One Hood looks like. And it really became, you know, um, not just a media academy per se, but it's also really become a collective of artists and, 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 and mentoring young artists. And, you know, me saying that, you know, you know, for instance, as a, a rap artist, I'll get questions like this. Well, you know, Jasiri, you're from Chicago originally. What do you think about Chief Keef? And so a rapper like Chief Keef now becomes the poster child for the destruction of hip hop. When he comes, he's as a 16 year old uh, from one of the most violent neighborhoods in the world. And, you know, trying to, you know, figure out what's happening in his neighborhood and utilizing his voice to speak about the situation that he see, he didn't create gangs. You know, he, Chief Keith didn't start gangs. He didn't create, he didn't create drill music. He didn't even come up with the term shy rock. You know, it was another uh, rapper in Chicago named King Louie that actually coined that term shy rock drill a noise, but he didn't create the environment. He just called it what he saw it. Policies created that environment. Who's more responsible for the state of Chicago, Chief Keith or Rahm Emanuel? But this is the, how this conversation begins to go. And so, you know, my, my response is, well, you know, I can't, you know, and I, I would tell people when they ask me this, um, I said, you know, the people that make the decisions in hip hop as to who gets signed and who gets funded, they don't look like me. You, normally they look like the people who's asking me the questions. They're all white men who not only met, it was Jimmy Iovine that decided to give Chief Key $6 million. And now if I'm a young rapper in Chicago, what does that, what do I do then? You know, what, what type of music do I decide to make when I see a rapper like Chief Keep six, get six million and I live in an economically depressed environment and I just wanna give me and my family out. And so to me, we wanted to also utilize you know, what we're doing to begin to change the conversation and empower ourselves, you know what I'm saying? Uh, anybody, I just wanted to start, any questions, comments? Yes. Right now it is that, you know, we have, although we have affiliates, we call them cousins, one hood cousins, you know what I'm saying? So we have, you know, uh, a, a group called the Get Down Gang that does break dance and that anytime we have an event, we're gonna call the Get Down Gang. You know, we have, you know, muralists, we have um, a guy named Cal Holbrook who actually goes all around the country and the world and does murals, but based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we have done murals, we actually did an incredible mural uh, project with the Andy Warhol Museum um, called Don't Let It Get Away With Murder. We actually did this silk screening. Um, so we've done stuff like that, but the majority is kind of the mentorship of younger artists. You know, It's one thing, like I said, to be critical of, but it's like a, a young person is only going to rap about what they know. 
And so what we felt like, and, and initially, I'm going to be honest, you know, initially when we started One Hood Media Academy, I kind of was arrogant. And I was like, man, I'm going to... I'm going to school these young dudes, these young, you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to drop so much knowledge on them, I'm going to blow their mind. And I remember early on, we were having a conversation about the Occupy movement. And one of my students said, well, you know, Jasiri, I mean, this is just an oligarchy anyway. And I was like, what? Is he 60? How you know that word? What? And, and it, it caused me to realize that, you know, the younger people I was dealing with were far more aware. And I think far more aware that sometimes we give them credit for being. Uh, we make assumptions about them based on how they look or how they dress or how they carry themselves. And so when I realized that, we realized that all we really had to do was give the information. So, you know, what we do is we come into one hood, we have food, and we'll show, you know, a video about, you know, whether it's police violence or whether it's about economic issues or, you know, what's happening in Flint with the water crisis, what's happening over here, you know what I'm saying? And just, and then we just have a conversation about it. And then at that point, when these young artists get into the booth, we don't have to say, rap this way. Because then that would be fake, you know? And there are some programs like that. It's like, oh, we're gonna do like the Martin Luther King rap. He was peaceful, he was, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's corny, it becomes corny, you know? We're all gonna dress up in suits, you know what I'm saying? It's, nah, we don't do that. We also decided not to censor our artists. We use profanity, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, how can you have a, to me, you can't have a real conversation about rap music and not play things that have profanity. Like, that's just, you're just not gonna do that. And so we give our parents a, a waiver, like, we're going to play things. We're not gonna be gratuitous. I said that today. I, that was my question. Can I cuss something here? <laughs> not gonna be gratuitous, but you know, just to know that I'm free to express myself if I wanna make a point. Um, and so that's the, the same thing we do. And so we allow our students the freedom uh, to speak how they want to speak. We don't coach them. All we do is provide them the information. And I feel like that can change the dynamic of what an artist raps about once they know, once they become informed, once they become aware, and also the power in their, that their music can affect them. I always tell my students, like, when you approach, when you put something out on social media or YouTube or anything like that, you're speaking to the world. And people in China can see you. People in Afghanistan can see you. People in Africa can see you. So if you're going to speak to the world, what are you going to say? And understand, like, how are you going to represent yourself, your family, your community, where you come from as you enter this space where you speak to the world? Um, and so that's a, so right now, I mean, although, and just, to, I know that was, I'm, I'm, I can get long-winded. That's why I told him, I was like, yo, just give me some type of signal, because I can talk about this all day. Uh, but so we don't engage in all necessarily, like in, in, the, in the structure of our classroom of like, you know, but we do at this point, uh, we would like to teach a DJ part of it. Um, we're actually looking at dance. You know, we have students that, that dance incredibly well um, that want to have a dance portion of One Hood Media Academy. And so we're talking to somebody right now that does dance to see if he's willing to come teaching and of course, we want to be able to pay him for his time. That's another thing. Like we pay our students for everything that they do, every performance that our students engage in. We pay them if they do anything, graphics or whatever. And what we try to do is move our students from being a part of the class into being a teaching artist. And we really are trying to show them that there is an entrepreneurial aspect to, you know, getting on. Like you can take your talents and gifts and actually make it a career. I know because that's what I did. And you know, I remember, um, and I left the Pittsburgh Public Schools because the more political my music got, the more heat I started to get at my job. So it wasn't that I wasn't good at, this is why systems fail. It wasn't that I wasn't good at my job or you know, my students didn't like me. It was that you didn't like what I was doing in the community and what I was saying when I began to do this rap. And so they kind of targeted me to be fired. And I was dumb at the time. I should have just let them fire me and then collect unemployment. I wasn't thinking like that. You know, I was being, I, I like, I, I came in one day and I said, you know what? My office felt like a prison. And I said, I'm leaving. And they had actually hired somebody to watch me. It got really bad. And so I just handed the lady my, my keys to my office and said, I'm out. I'm not saying that you should do that. Give your two week notice. <laughs> But I remember the last direct deposit check. 
and me saying, like, now I got to go and make something happen. And then looking after that year was over and seeing that I had made twice as much doing what I love to do than I made at this job that I enjoyed interacting with the students, but I didn't like the politics of it. So, you know, I encourage you, you know, I know you all are in college, like, and, you know, the, the job market isn't where it was. It used to be like you was almost guaranteed. Go to college, get a degree, get a job. It's not like that anymore. So I would encourage you to, one, use this opportunity time to find out what you're passionate about and what you love to do, and then use these resources to try to build a actual business around what you love to do, and then you don't work a day in your life because you're doing what you love. I mean, I do this all day long, and I travel all over the country, and I get paid to do it. I'm surprised, uh, but it's a blessing. I mean, I'm, I'm literally happy uh, uh, about that, so I would encourage you all to do that as well. Yes, sir, my Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Um, being raised, actually born in uh, New York, and uh, I Right. Yeah. The thing yeah. that's a little bit confusing is where is you've got rap going on and how does it turn into hip hop? You well, say hip hop because yeah. you know back back in, back in the seventies, you know, you had those places in the boroughs where they were doing rap. Right. So uh, the, sometimes that that hip hop gets lost. Where did it, where is hip hop? Is it the same as rap? When I heard your thing, it sounds like rap to me, and you're saying it's hip hop. That, that's a great and I'm not question, arguing yeah. with you. I just no, that's a I great get question. Confused. No, because I sometimes will assume that somebody knows, and the fact that you came and asked that question showed me. And it kind of goes back to the gentleman's question. Hip hop is the entire culture. So rap is a piece of it. And hip hop was uh, coined by Africa Bambata. So when I say hip hop, I'm not just talking about rap. I'm also talking about graffiti. I'm talking about uh, uh, break dancing. I'm talking about DJ. And I'm also talking about you know one element of hip hop uh, the African Bombarda said that a lot of times we forget his knowledge of self. So all of this comes under the banner of hip-hop. So it just so happened that rap was given um, preeminence because of its ability to make money. And, you know, we live in a capitalistic society. And so, you know, rap makes the most money for corporations. And so that's why rap kind of gets held up uh, um, outside of others. So I like to use the term hip hop because okay. it, it, it gives the, the listener idea that it's part of a culture. Because if it wasn't for the DJ, it wouldn't be a rapper. You know, if it was the, the culture of hip hop is, is, that, is that, you know, uh, ecosystem that then begins to produce rappers and DJs and graffiti artists and breakdance, but also activists so, as well. So, Hip hop, where does that relate to the Zulu nation and Africa? Bad body, right. He coins yeah. the term hip hop. So right. he okay. So yeah, so and 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 you know, I don't even know what came I, I would assume hip hop came before even rap. You know what I'm saying? But the the only thing, like I said, people began to take rap because rap was that like MC that can go and make a record and they could play that record. Now, just to deal with your point when you talk about from, you know, uh, and this is a, another great question, from Cool Herc and all those people, yeah. and then you get to NWA. Well, what happened in between that? Well, a big thing happened. Well, I would argue that, I mean, well, you had a, a president named Ronald Reagan comes into power and begins to change the economic conditions of our community, then you had, you know, the Iran-Contra scandal, and you had the crack epidemic hit our community starting in the West Coast. You know, if you, I would encourage you to read a book if you're interested in how crack cocaine comes. Um, it's a book called Dark Alliance. It was written by an author named Gary Webb. Uh, they just actually did a movie about Gary Webb called Kill the Messenger. Um, that, you know, he ends up reporting on the government's connection 
uh, with allowing crack cocaine to come into our communities and then taking the profits and buying weapons from Iran to give to the Contras in Nicaragua. He exposes this thing, and of course, he was demonized, he was criticized, he was, you know, basically called crazy, and then, of course, it came out that it was all true, and then he dies mysteriously um, as well. And so, um, you know, I would encourage you not just to watch the movie Kill the Messenger, which is a good movie, but his book, Dark Alliance, breaks down how the DEA, who's supposed to, you know, protect us from drugs coming to community, actually aided, you know, people like the original Rick Ross, <laughs> not the rapper Rick Ross, but Freeway Ricky Ross, to become one of the first crack multimillionaires. And so I think sometimes we look at that, and like I said, we place the blame on the rapper and we miss the context because NWA was reporting on a environment that they did not create, but that they were a part of. And so the, the violence coming out of that is a product of a violent community in which they, as young people, have to begin to try to navigate. So, you know, watch the movie Straight Outta Compton, which is, you know, and th thus, of course, Fuck the Police, one of the greatest rap songs of all time, you know, comes out of NWA, you know what I'm saying, and you know, yeah, so I would say watch the movie Straight Outta Compton. It's a really good movie, you know, great, great acting. Whoever played Dr. Dre, I felt like he should have got nominated. He was incredible. Um, and that will give you a little more context of NWA um, as well. Um, any other questions? Yes. women, um, the inherent sexism, misogyny, all of that yes. fun stuff. Um, can you speak to that a little bit, not just in hip-hop, I guess, in music in general, and what your thoughts are on that? Well, I mean, my thoughts are, you know, we're a product of a society that teaches us to objectify women. I mean, we're about to go watch the Super Bowl, and, you know, when you watch all those commercials, you know, you see what's the, the woman who's the NASCAR driver, and... She's on the GoDaddy commercial, but it's not showing her skill as a driver. It's showing her in the scantily clad, you know what I'm saying? And not to say that a woman can't be proud of how she looks or, or, or have ownership of her sexuality, you know what I'm saying? But oftentimes, the, the, the sexuality of women is used to sell products. And so now, we're a part of this world, and we come up and we turn the TV on and we watch this, and you know what I'm saying? They're saying, you know, study, uh, or, you know, I've heard people say it might not, we might not have high speed uh, internet if it wasn't for the success of pornography and how much money pornography makes in this country. So I think these are all, so for me, you know, as somebody who tries to not objectify women, I still do it. You know, I still do and act in ways that are misogynistic. And, you know, thankfully, I'm around a strong group of women that will be like, but that will check me, starting with my wife. <laughs> you know, but I still have to sometimes come out of this mindset. And so we're a product of it. And so then when we speak, you know, oftentimes that's what you hear. And so, what, and, and this is to me, you know, I've become educated by the voice of women, particularly women of color on social media, about issues in regards to gender politics. You know what I'm saying? Most of what I learned is coming from women that are utilizing their platform to really educate people when it comes to things like street harassment that I just don't know about. Or, I, you know, how am I conditioned as a man to like, okay, if you see a good looking woman and hey, baby, what you, you know, I was saying, what's up, you know, can I get your number? Da, da. That's like how we're conditioned, you know what I'm saying? Not thinking that, uh, you know, you might not want to talk to me. <laughs> or you have the right to say, get out of here, and I can't be offended by this. And so I think that, and, and so now what's coming out of it, I feel like, you know, people are beginning to address that topic more and more in hip hop. And, 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 there's also this piece of like, where's the, where are the women rappers? And they're, you know, where the conscious rappers are. They're everywhere. But, you know, the major, they're not in the major label system, unfortunately. The major label system seems to operate in a way where they feel like only one different person can fill the space at one time. You know, so it's like only one white rapper can fill the space. So we have Eminem and now Macklemore, 
he can fill the space. Only one, it's only one woman. We got Nicki Minaj, but she's the only one that, and it's, it's weird that it works like that. But I always tell people when you want to like, I travel a lot, I use an app called Yelp. You know, if I come to Pullman and I want to know where a good restaurant is, I have two options. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, de- I'm done. <laughs> so, but I could like look at Yelp or I could do the research on the internet or I could ask somebody from that area. It's the same way with, you know, pop, hip hop. You know, one of my favorite artists is a young woman from Atlanta named Cy Rock. I mean, I feel like when it comes to lyricists, she's, ain't nobody messing with her, you know what I'm saying? But she's somebody that, because of how she carries herself and what she says, is a major label. Maybe they will, you know, maybe with the success of Kendrick and J. Cole and these other artists. Uh, so these are, you know, some of the people that I will point other folks too, but it's really asking people, are there any artists addressing these issues and gender policies? And more than likely there are, and some doing it very well. So unfortunately, you know, we got to really deal with the, and, and this is what people are pushing back on, the culture of America. You know, this white male supremacist system, which I'll get into a little bit later when we talk about Dr. King and how Dr. King is used, but not followed. So yeah, but thank you for that. This gentleman right here, you had a question? Absolutely. I'm really interested in how you started to talk about earlier bridging this generational divide or gap that you've seemed to found between older generations, maybe coming from the civil rights yes. or right after that, and then now the hip hop generations. And one of the things that you started to mention was how some of your songs are more call to action for other artists, either these established artists or up and coming artists. Right. So I was wondering if you could speak to how you've tried to continue that call to action either through One Hood, has this organization reached out, or do you think about expanding and reaching out to other artists that could serve either as mentors or you know ways in just building that kind of momentum? Absolutely. I mean, I have, you know, th- I mean, I've been blessed and to have mentors, you know what I'm saying? I was talking to a brother, um, to brother, I think Keith, who picked me up, uh, from Mississippi. One of my mentors is David Banner, um, who, you know, actor, producer, rapper, he has an album coming out called The God Box that's incredible. Um, another artist that I've done a lot with is a, a rapper named Rhyme Fest. Um, for those that might not uh, know who, or, or maybe remember Rhyme Fest per se, uh, Rhyme Fest, because he's known more for his writing. Rhyme Fest uh, has a Grammy for co-writing Jesus Walks. Um, he's written on every Kanye project except for 808 and Heartbreaks. Um, he also uh, has an Oscar and uh, um, Golden Globe for co-writing Glory uh, with Common and John Legend. And so he's not only an incredible artist, but he has an organization in Chicago called Donda's House, which is named after Kanye's mother. Kanye's on the board, and they do similar work uh, that we do around building young people up artistically. Um, you know, he kind of, you know, came at Spike Lee, which I felt was justified over the movie Chirac, you know, in a very strong way, and really calling on Spike to, if you're going to utilize that term, put some resources back in the city of Chicago, as well as, you know, I have, you know, somebody like Dream Hampton. Um, who's an author um, and, you know, was a writer at The Source magazine and does now is a filmmaker and doing incredible things um, and, uh, to somebody like Rosa Clemente, um, who's, you know, a hip-hop academic, scholar, activist, um, and somebody that I would say, you know, if she hasn't been here, uh, somebody that I would say that, that people would benefit. And then when it comes to generationally, I, sometimes I feel like the generation thing is also... Um, it's like the mentality because, you know, my OG is Harry Belafonte. Um, and, you know, I've been uh, interacting with Harry Belafonte since 2005. He started an organization called The Gathering for Justice, and I was blessed to be a part of it. You know, Harry Belafonte sent me to Ferguson, um, you know, to, you know, at that time, because of what was happening in the street, you know, he's um, 88. And so um, he couldn't physically go. But he sent myself, he sent a young woman named Carmen Perez, who was executive director of the Gathering for Justice, to go. And he wanted to see who he could support, what young leaders he can put um, resources behind. And so to me, sometimes it also is uh, its not generational. It's really a mindset, you know what I'm saying? Because he's somebody, he just recently started an organization called Sankofa. Uh, if you go to sankofa.org, and it's really, he's inspiring artists and encouraging artists to utilize their art and their fame to begin to talk about social justice issues. Uh, one artist recently that has been involved is Usher. 
Um, he just did a song around police brutality, um, and he's shooting a video around it. He's been doing some things in the community as well, and you know, some people saw when they did the conversation, and Jay Z came, and you know, but you know, because Mr. Belafonte and Jay Z had a little thing, and you know, that's dead. It we all coming together in unity and peace and love, and so um, that's something that I would look at. So absolutely, yeah, but definitely doing that generational piece as well and doing that work. So thank you for that. Yes, you had a question? Or you were just, you just went to your, yeah, I thought, I saw you do a move. Okay, um, so I, I did wanna, I don't know, how much time do I have? I'm good, okay. So this is another thing that I kind of do um, that I feel like contributes to some of the success that I have is, um, one day, you know, I have a good, one of my mentors is, um, to me, I believe, one of the best hip-hop journalists. Um, his name is Davey D. Uh, he's from the Bay Area. Um, he has a radio show called Hard Knock Radio on KPFA. Um, and he called me one day, and he said, bro, he said, um, I was DJ in a high school, and I played some of your music, and, you know, they wasn't feeling it. And he was saying, it, they, it's not that they wasn't feeling it because it was good, they weren't feeling it because they didn't recognize it. And he was like, what you all need to do is take some of these beats that people recognize that these companies spend multi-million dollars promoting and getting into the minds of people, and you should take those and put some social consciousness on them. So when I do the song Trayvon, if you ever heard the song that I did around Trayvon Martin, I'll, I'll probably perform it later on tonight, um, I use No Church for the Wild. And so when you hear that B, you hear No Church for the Wild, but then here I come, and I'm you know, rapping. Interestingly enough, it was just taken off of YouTube uh, because of Tidal. Tidal comes in, and you know, Jay-Z, you know, he's not gonna be pimped, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jay-Z, he's gonna own it. Like, I, I, I give him credit for that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so you can't find it online anymore. Well, I mean, there's a live version, but the original version, you know, because of Jay-Z. Maybe we can appeal to Jay-Z to put it back on. Um, so this is a song I took um, Drake's. Uh, actually, this was inspired by a group called the Dream Defenders. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dream Defenders, an amazing group uh, that came out of the movement around Trayvon Martin. Uh, after George Zimmerman was found not guilty, they occupied the Florida State House for um, 30 days. And so when Jordan Davis who was killed uh, because he was playing loud music, and this guy thought he had the authority to tell him to turn it down, and when they didn't, shot the car, killing Jordan Davis. When uh, Jordan Davis, when he was found guilty of attempted murder, but not the murder of Jordan Davis, the Dream Defenders started this incredible meme called America Never Loved Us, and using the hashtag Never Loved Us, which was a play on Drake song, so I, you know, called uh, my brother Umi, who uh, was executive director of Dream Defenders. I said, hey, man, I'm about to take this beat. Y'all got me inspired. And so, um, you know, shout out to them. So I did this song called I Never Loved Us. And shout out to Drake, too. You know, I know that, um, you know, just because we're both light-skinned don't mean we look alike. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> all light-skinned people don't look alike. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> shout out to Drake, though. Never loved us. Remember? Worst 
behavior. Did we pay more attention to Michael's new Jordans? Or the outcome of Michael shooting Jordan? For protection, do I need a rifle when performing? If we start turning up, when they try to murder us? Dangerous black kids ain't welcome in suburbia. All we want is justice and equality to none of us. Still deny services, criminalized by journalists. Turn the other chicken, get killed by Christian conservatives. Mass incarcerated in prison is where they hurting us. Calling us thugs, you hear them trying to reach a us. Acting like ain't nothing worse than us. But be the first to bust last to get searched and cuffed. We ain't forget you used to purchase us. We were swinging from the trees or you burnt us up. Now we organized and ready to stick the merchants up. So get them purses up before you see us on our worst behavior. America never loved us. Remember? In Cali, they never loved us. Remember? Make them churches, they never loved us. Remember? Worst behavior. Andy Lopez was only 13. Seven shots from the sheriff left him in the dirt lane. To his mother and his father had to be the worst scene. Do you know what hurt means when you see a child dead in his shirt scene? Liquid from the thickness of the blood still squirting. Dear God, can you answer me first thing? Can you wipe the earth clean? Of the violence in this world, let the church sing. Amen. Turn to today's him. Who's going to save them? Because in North Carolina, Jesus, they slayed him. In the back of a cop car cut, they sprayed him. And told us that he killed himself. That's Satan. So when you see me, you're on MSNBC. I hope folks live and I bust both fives. Until I see America shut both sides. Go to Hearst to claim my worst behavior. Worst behavior. Worst behavior. Remember? All right. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So one of the, um, actually the first case uh, I talked about in there where we had all of the shirts on uh, was another case in Pittsburgh with a young man named Leon Ford. Um, Leon Ford was driving in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Um, police pulled him over. Um, he had a Lexus, uh, which was his. Uh, he gave the police his license, uh, which was up to date and fine, and gave the police his registration. But for some reason, the police felt like this could not be this person. This is a state issue Pennsylvania ID. So the police go back into the computer, and instead of putting in Leon Ford, they put in L Ford. And they pull up another guy who was, had a warrant. And so they decide, well, this, might, this must be L Ford. And so they come back to the car, and um, uh, you know, they, a couple of things they didn't do. They didn't tell Leon to turn his car off. So he was sitting and he had his, um, his foot on the brake. And so the police officer comes over and says, get out of the car. And he's like, what are you, I gave you my ID, I gave you my registration, like what's the problem? Police officer proceeds to pull, to try to pull Leon Ford out of the driver's seat through the window. Um, as his foot lifts off on the brake, the car starts to move. Now when the car starts to move, no officers are in front of the car or in any danger. One of the officers jumps into the back seat and shoots Leon four or five times. Thankfully, he lived, you know, and, but he's paralyzed uh, from the waist down. And so he, Leon was charged with assaulting a police officer, uh, a case that he beat. So now he has a civil trial, but if he, he has a website called Justice for Leon, once, you know, he would be another person that he's an incredibly um, positive, and he's actually using his influence as he became known in the city to come into our communities to mediate some violence and beefs in our community, a very positive and, and, and powerful young man. So uh, shout out to Leon Ford. And one of the reasons why those Justice for Leon shirts, you know, just a real quick on that, he was utilizing social media for his case in such a powerful way that during his trial, they actually issued a social media blackout. They would not allow him to use social media during the trial. The first day of trial, 200 people showed up in the courtroom. And if you had a Justice for Leon shirt, they made you leave, and it was all of this whole thing. And so, uh, yeah, that's the environment that they were in, but also uh, the power of, of social media. But also, you know, like I said, I'll use those. You know, a lot of times, you know, somebody will invite me in, particularly if I'm coming into, you know, a neighborhood. The most difficult audience is young black people. Because, you know, the teacher might be excited, like, I got a rapper named Jasiri X. And like, they like, I don't know Jasiri X. Like, who's Jasiri X? And so when I play this beat, it's something that they recognize. And then as I start to kind of kick what I kick over this beat, it creates like, oh, OK, that's cool. OK, you, you, you all right? You decent? All right, all right, let's have a conversation now. You know what I'm saying? So that's another reason. So they haven't, Drake hasn't came for that beat. You know what I'm saying? So man, 
hopefully, I, I just did another one to another Drake beat out on. He just, he got good beats, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I just did, if you, uh, I just did uh, Preach. If you heard, uh, you know, if you're reading this, it's too late. You know what I'm saying? I just did that. So I'm going to drop that, I think, on my birthday, February 15th. So, um, yeah, what, that's your birthday? February 15th? Oh, snap. We got to go, you know, hang out a little bit. Uh, Aquarius season. Um, real quick, uh, just so just this is showing kind of like what we do for One Hood. Um, we also help our students get their product out. Product out. So this is uh, actually one of our teaching artists, Black Rap Medusa, when it comes to a, a young woman coming with some real lyrics. She's also Muslima. Um, and, you know, she actually just left us. She went to uh, Atlanta. Um, but shout out to Black Rap Medusa. That's her project. You can get that on iTunes. Um, uh, this is a young man named Apollo. Um, his project is called Ill Lucidity. He just actually graduated from performing arts school in Pittsburgh. Um, his project starts off and he's dreaming. And then at the end of it, he wakes up. It's a real, real dope project. Um, this is another one of our graduating seniors. Um, he still works with us, uh, named Tahir Frost. Um, his album is IDOL, I Depend on Life. And then that's my new project, uh, Black Liberation Theology, uh, if y'all want to check it out. So um, this is actually a song that we did together. When you saw that picture of all of us, uh, we did a video called Young, Gifted, and Black. So this isn't just me. This is some of the other uh, One Hood MCs. So I definitely want to show this to y'all, and uh, we can get into some more questions. Microphones with stigmata. My first take is the second coming. On the third day, I rose with the four or five weapon dumping. My lineage is the pyramids. I'm the capstone. When it comes to these rap homes, I'm the backbone. It's X, J A S, I R I. And triple dark and shining light like a fire. The incredible cannibal has stepped in the room, chomping the bag of shrooms, smashing every whack rapping goon. Already married the game. Now we jump in the boom. You wanna fuck with my mic? You must love falling in doom. This too many wanna be rappers claiming to be the best, but they get no doubt. I sound for the sun up, but y'all don't wanna listen, so it's hard for us to come up. I'm young, I'm young, get this, a brother of color. Man, I'm flexing while manifesting my imagination, exploiting aggravation. Take my words as a threat, you'll die through the snow. Words like walking Jesus on water, my flow will forever flow. You want competition? Clear the crowd on sight. So I'm my auto watch unite. We about the blow. Yeah, get away. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. One hood, one mic, no knives. No not the cat and that cost. Kill beats, I'm sorry for your loss. Sorry. My rap flowed and gone and evolved. Yeah. Sometimes like it be a sea song. But I'm up cause the top must fall. Must fall. Rap guys, they all mythological. Ghost fitters and I don't write for none of them. New school kid on flow, got them loving it. Blue flame coming with my own elements. Turn graves cause the kings wanna smell a bit. Yeah. Super swag like the man, I ain't even rich. I ain't even rich. I'm the great bambino, he's a kid, got the cure, but this is no chemo. Is no chemo. Can you feel it? Radiation from a hero, I done seen it already, I ain't asked Miss Cleo. I'm young, black, and gifted like Christmas, the sun's back, sacrificing for the children, the truth of the fact, we ain't nothing like the Tempest, Darwin, he was wrong about that. What he missed was the Anunnaki blood mixed with homo sapiens, then the God body champion, we welcome all challenges. On guard, when you enter our stadium, we'll be prepared for a supernatural massacre, I cannot be Stopped until the sun boils down, becomes the earth and the moon, and life's done. The God sees sprouts a new soul to be the nucleus of a solar system like genetics in my blood. That's why I stay in touch with the ancestors, dig my feet into the mud and vibe with the ancient lectures. Baby B said our babies will be celestial. Our first son, Enoch the shepherd. It's the L-U-C live from the NRV with the Comitian priest. B -b -b Banging on the drum, the Christ is back. Dressed like the men in black with tailored slacks. Wiping the slabs, spitting the dirt, revealing third eye sight you thought you never had gaze into my eyes so i can look into the past what i see is the solar system as a planetary fleet sailing through the universe of black Reap every line is divine every rhyme let it shine like the light jesus lucifer one of a kind now you see 
is the trinity, divinity, infinity. We young, black, and gifted, man, as many of me. Plenty of me, are they ready for me? Stick with double lips, he's about to crib. He's the master of the triple blackness. Young and gifted, cause our mind is the blackest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we actually put that on, um, we put it on like Facebook and like a lot of people were sharing it and it got a lot of views and, you know, it's beautiful to see kind of, you know, an idea come to fruition and then, you know, the students get excited because people are listening to them and, and um, the, the last guy that rapped, his name is uh, Luke, uh, L-U-C, Love Unconditional. That shirt that he had, that's actually his own clothing line, it's called Voodoo. Um, and so also just trying to, like I said, encourage um, our students and really, um, you know, push our students to, you know, begin to produce things and, and just be as creative as possible. Um, any other questions, comments? Oh, that's Ty here Frost. Yeah, he came up, coming through the door. Yeah, you know, Ty, like Ty here, he is funny. He came to One Hood with the belief that he was the greatest rapper of all time. And uh, he had, you know, he had never been in a booth before. And so when he, when he got into a booth, he struggled a little bit. And, you know, we were, you know, hard on him. We gave him that tough love, but he was so determined. Uh, you know, part of being a good rapper is you have to have confidence. You have to have, like, a high level of confidence. And so, like, you know, I would encourage you. Um, his project is on um, um, SoundCloud. If you go to Tyre Frost on SoundCloud, um, check out his newer stuff because I feel like he's even better than, than what you see there and then really become a student of the game. So he's working on, he just went to college, he's working on uh, uh, his new project called Dorm Room Thoughts. And I've heard a little bit of it and I'm excited about, you know, what he's producing um, as well. So yeah, yes sir. Oh, oh wait, I forgot. Um, it, before you ask a question, we need to get you the mic because if you ask a question, and that was my fault, um, without the mic, the people on the live stream you know, can't hear. Yeah, okay. So, your topic that I saw was talking about how to do music and keep your integrity. Yes. And when you look, you know, being uh, a retired musician of too long, and looking back, you know, with when you look at Duke Ellington and you look at uh, 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 Louis Armstrong, who were backed by gangsters, and then you go and you find out cats like James Brown got screwed over by his uh, people who were trying to abuse him and the yep. whole nine yards. How we find out that the record producers, the people who are in charge, they decide whether you're going to be a hit or not. And so it seems like you're doing independent. Absolutely. And, and how do you, and I know they still have people saying, oh, yeah, they got this you know, one day at the hood. Man, we got to yeah, get them yeah. out of business. Do you, do you feel that happens to you from other companies around uh, the well, country or they it, try and push you out? It, well, not really. You know, what happened, the music industry really is, it really is gone. Like, what you're seeing of the music industry right now is really almost like a dying animal kind of like you know we see the fish if we take the fish out of water and it's flopping that's what we're watching with the music industry right now it's really it's really gone like the music industry that we knew who i mean when's the last time you turned on the radio and like you discovered a new song by listening to whatever radio station you're listening to and then you know you went and bought the remember you know i i go back remember it was the cassette singles like you know what i mean like you we don't even consume music like that anymore. You know, oftentimes the way music is being consumed, the internet totally changed that. And this is one of the things that, you know, uh, 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 you know, props to Steve Jobs. You know, when Steve Jobs came to the record industry with iTunes, they dissed him. And he did it, and now, you know, it really put them in a very, you know, that, that was really became the death of the industry. So they just don't have that power. Like, being played on the radio doesn't really matter anymore. I mean, you look at what to me, what J. Cole recently did where, you know, last year, um, he, you know, he announces maybe two weeks before he puts out the project, oh, um, putting out this album, you know, 2015, Forest Hill Drive. 
And, you know, he put like one, I don't even know, he might not have even put the video out. It made it came out maybe a few days before the album dropped. It wasn't a push to get a record on the radio. And he puts this album out and it's so good that he becomes the first artist in, I think maybe they said uh, uh, 20 years to have go platinum without any features. You know, that's how good his project was. Kendrick Lamar just put out uh, a project called The Pimple Butterfly. I didn't hear it being played a lot over the radio, you know, some of the singles that he put out, but that still was an impactful project and sold well. So the control that the record, and then there's this whole other thing about streaming and how the, econ the economics of streaming is happening. So to me, if there are any rappers in here, like it used to be, this is how the industry would work. You know, if you look at kind of like Beyonce and like Alicia Keys, like, like they were like chosen at a time and then they were developed. Like they like, you know, dance lessons and singing lessons. And then it was a time, you know, like I remember, you know, Clive Davis introduced, here's my new protege, Alicia Keys. And it's become, that don't, there's no funds for a &R like that. It's not that like, if you think, and I, I thought that at one time, I thought like one day, like Russell Simmons was just gonna knock on my door. Hey, uh, I heard there was a rapper named Jasiri here. And I, it doesn't work that way. So really, you have to build your own fan, regardless of who you are. So now, at the point where you build your fan base, I don't think, you know, I remember when, you know, Wiz signed. At the time, I was kind of saying, why? Like, you have your own fan base already. What do you need a label? Now, he, you know, went to the stratosphere with Black and Yellow, and so, you know, that was a good decision. But there was another rapper in Pittsburgh that decided to remain independent named Mac Miller. And he, as an independent rap artist, had the number one album in the country as an independent rapper. And he just recently signed, I think they said a $30 million deal with Warner Brothers. And so building your own fan base and doing it yourself actually puts you in a much stronger economic financial position. Also too, like if you sign a deal today, the deal is what they call a 360 record deal. So the industry, record industry decided like they were making these rapper stars and then the rappers were doing movies and they were doing all those other things. So they decided, well, we deserve a piece of that. You know, so now if you sign a 360 deal, you, you know, you go on tour, they get a piece of that. You in a movie, they get a piece of that. You do a commercial, they get a piece of that. I'm, I'm not interested in, you know, doing, making less money you know, overall, and so now the move is to do independently. You know, there's a rapper uh, from Chicago named Chance the Rapper just became the first independent rap artist to do Saturday Night Live. You know, and it was like, when, when Chance blew up, I remember, and the people was like, oh, is he gonna sign? He had a song with Justin Bieber. I'm like, if you can get a song with Justin Bieber as an independent artist, what do you need a record label for? At that point, it's just overhead, you know? So I feel like rappers are making, like we're becoming more businessmen and I feel like the independence of it is why you see the, the, um, the, the uh, topics opening up. And you see rappers talking about all these different topics and you know, and I feel like because of the independent nature of hip hop right now, you know what I'm saying, you can move that way. So I would definitely encourage you all to do it. And then I always encourage rap artists to do something else besides rap. If I had to rely on just performance, like putting an album out, doing a tour and doing some performances to pay my rent, I wouldn't be able to do it. But I do other things. I do workshops. I do speaking engagements. I have an organization, One Hood, where we have a, you know, an organization in our community. I'll write blogs. I like do other things. You know what I'm saying? And so I become, I'm, I'm relevant beyond what song or album I put out because of these other things I do. I'm involved in the struggle. It's, I'm not just rapping about what's happening, but I'm be involved on the ground as an activist. So I encourage people to do more things, you know what I'm saying? But it begins with, you know, you, you know, having some type of presence on social media. Like the one thing that I see, I feel like artists, you know, is okay, you made a great album, now how are we gonna hear it? And so if you don't access and utilize social media, then how, like, you know, there's, how are we gonna find you? How are we gonna discover you? And so that's kind of what not only we've been able to do, but also been able to like have a ground game in Pittsburgh where people know me, they know One Hood, they know our community organization. This was an event that we did um, in One Hood called One Hood Day, where we brought the, you know, sometimes the question is, 
And this will be the last thing I say. I'm getting that thing. Sometimes the question is like, okay, you do socially conscious music, but the audience sometimes is not people in our community. And so how do, what do you do? Well, we took the social conscious hip hop concert into the hood, set the, set the, set the uh, thing up right on the basketball court. You know what I'm saying? Some of the, some of the homies in the hood came out. They came out, they said, we want to perform. We'll pay you to perform. You don't got to pay us, man. It's your community, man. Take the stage, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, we had just a dope event. That's me jumping right there to the left. You see me jumping up and down. That's a rapper named Tef Poe, another artist that came out of the Ferguson movement, but an incredible MC. If you don't know him, I would holler at him as well. And so th that's the advice I would give. So thank, thank you for your question. Thank you for having me. I look forward to getting into some more music and some, some you know, maybe a little, it's going to be a little heavier tonight, but hopefully it'll be... Good. It's going to be good, right? No doubt about it. All right. So thank y'all for having us. I'm just serious. Come all the way back. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm Steve Bam. Nakata, and I'm a member of the MLK Celebration Planning Committee. And we're just so thrilled to have you here, just Siri. Thank you. Uh, what a great workshop. Would you agree? Yeah, it was so engaging, so interesting. Yeah, let's give it up one more time. And thank you for your questions. I mean, I appreciated the dialogue. So those that, that and then I'm here. I have cards. I, hear, I have CDs if you want to maybe grab something now. If you can't make it later on tonight, come holler at me. Definitely. Um, and I advise you to come on time, if not early. Uh, we expect a big crowd tonight, so if you want to get a good seat, get there on time. Um, bring your friends as well. And thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to grab a cookie or some food on your way out, please do. There's a lot there. And we'll see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.